those words that Russ just read from the Apostle Paul, they're pretty famous words, but if we stop and think about them for just a minute, when I'm weak, I'm strong. Uh, and Paul's whole point is there's lots of people get caught up wondering what is Paul's thorn in the flesh. It really doesn't matter. What matter is Paul has something in his life that makes him dependent on Christ. And that's, we're going we're gonna to look at that a little bit through the, what we're going to read here. Remember last week we read of how Jesus had these two encounters as he was, he was going to heal uh, Jairus' daughter, Jairus, a man of some importance, he's going to heal her. And while he's walking there, this lady, who we don't even get a name, this woman, uh, touches his robe and is instantly healed. And then we're told Jairus' daughter has died, but Jesus tells him not to worry, and he goes there and he raises her from the dead. But he won't let anybody know about it. Uh, so we had one, a woman who seeks healing from Jesus in secret. She sneaks up behind him. And the other one, Jesus raises this little girl from the dead and keeps it a secret and doesn't let anybody talk about it. Um, and then it says, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. And then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then Jesus went from village to village, teaching the people. And he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out unclean spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but, did not, but not to take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave, the leave town. But if, you place ref if, if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned the, those people to their fate. So the disciples went out telling everyone, what they, everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people anointing them with olive oil. Well, to start with, we've got these three statements. Nazareth, his hometown, he's just a carpenter, and the son of Mary. Um, I want to see a quick show of hands. How many of you grew up in towns smaller than Fairfield? <laughs> okay, wow, that's more than I thought. Over half. So... What are some of, the de some of the defining characteristics of a small town are everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows everybody's business. Yeah, I, you knew what I was going to say before I even got halfway through that sentence. Everybody knows everybody's business. And I'll never, I didn't grow up in a small town. And, and I'll never forget when, when a relative of mine moved to a small town where they were a teacher. And I was talking to them, and they'd lived there a while once. They said, this is really, she said, it's creepy living in a small town. <laughs> said, I went to a movie the other night, and the next day when I went to school to teach, the kids didn't ask, what did you do this weekend? And they didn't ask, and because they knew she went to a movie, they didn't ask, did you like the movie? Because they already knew her opinion of the movie. Because <laughs> in a small town, everybody knows everybody's business. So Jesus goes back to his hometown. Now, archaeologists believe Nazareth was a town of about 300 people. Yeah, that's a small town. That's a town where everybody really knows everybody's business. And Jesus comes home to a small town, and the people are offended when he starts to preach. 
which leads me to believe that there was nothing in Jesus' childhood that led the people who knew him from when he was a little toddler that would lead them to believe Jesus was headed to great things. Nothing in Jesus' past led the people to believe he was going to become a, a preacher and a healer and a, and a rabbi. He comes and they say, he's just a carpenter. Now, I know we got some carpenters sitting here. And I, of the carpenters in this room, I would never say he's just a carpenter because they can do amazing things with wood. We've got some evidence right up here. And I've got some evidence around my house and lots of houses around this town of, of the skill. Maybe a better way to put it as far as job correlation would be the people said, he's just a construction worker. That puts it in a little more kind of if the, if the uh, pecking or employment pecking order. The carpenter, you know, they do amazing things. Construction worker, I know some people hired to be construction workers. I, I don't know if they'd know which end of the hammer to hold if their foreman didn't tell them. So that's what they say. He's just a construction worker, or maybe he's just a handyman. What, who does he think he is coming here and preaching in front of our synagogue, getting up in front of our worship and preaching? Who does he think he is? He's just the son of Mary. Now think about that. Why didn't they say the son of Joseph? Small town. Everybody knows everybody's business. And those people in that town could count as well as any of us. And they could count the date for Mary and Joseph's wedding, and they didn't get to nine months before Jesus is born. It is quite possible that Jesus grew up with the people in that town talking behind his back about his illegitimacy, how his mom and dad weren't married when he was conceived, and maybe even Joseph isn't really his dad. Those were two of the attacks, the earliest attacks on Christianity. Were one, their leader was a, just a common laborer, and two, there's questions about his legitimacy of his birth. That's how the pagans attacked Christianity. They didn't attack what Jesus taught, not the first attacks. They attacked, he's a laborer, and there's questions about his birth, about who his father really is. And those questions probably circulated in this little town. Everybody kind of, yeah, let's see, he was born in December. Mary and Joseph got married in July. Doesn't add up. You don't get to nine. And so they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. This is one of those passages that really bothers people. And my guess is it's bothered Christians since it was first written down. When it says, because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles. Not he wouldn't, but he couldn't do any miracles. Here's the starting point of kind of that statement that there is a relationship between our faith and God's activity. Now, I, for one, am very nervous to go really far in tightly defining that relationship because God relates to people in many different ways. And if we try and say, this, this X is the relationship between our faith and God's work, we're putting God in a box. And, we're, and then we're defining who God is and how God acts. But leave it to say that there is a relationship between our faith and God's work. I, I came across a quote this last week that I really like. Um, this is from a guy named uh, William Platcher. He was a, a Christian teacher, uh, like seminary professor of, of note, died about five years ago. This is what he said. If people have no faith, it puts an insurmountable barrier between them and God, but God can surmount 
insurmountable barriers. I thought, well, that's about as far as I want to go with that statement. That sums it up pretty well. That when our faith puts up insurmountable barriers, we worship a God that can surmount insurmountable barriers. Things like raising people from the dead, which is an insurmountable barrier to you and I. But there's something really important in the bigger picture going on here. This is a turning point. There are some very key things that have been happening in Jesus' ministry that change or stop. This is the third time that Jesus has preached in a synagogue that Mark tells us. It's the third time he's been opposed, first by the demons, and then by the religious authorities, and now by his neighbors and old friends. And something happens now. You know, three is kind of in the Bible. It's a number of completeness, the Trinity, and, and things like that. Jesus will never enter a synagogue again. Now think of that. That's like saying a pastor will never go to church again. Because he got, now I know some pastors who have had some really difficult congregations who said, I'm never going back. But think of it, Jesus never, he is, he is rejecting the systems that are in place. He's never going to go into a synagogue and preach again. From here on out, Jesus goes to the town squares and to the countryside. And he is, in effect, telling the people, I am rejecting your system that you have in place. I am, I am rejecting your worship. And I'm going somewhere else. That's pretty significant, I think, that he never again enters a synagogue. After every time he goes to a synagogue and preaches, he's opposed by somebody. Some, a different, you know, they represent the different elements. They were, the, the demons representing kind of the spiritual realm. The religious authorities representing, well, religious authorities. And then the people representing those people sitting in the pews. He says, all of you have opposed me. I'm taking my show somewhere else. And I'm rejecting the way you're doing things. And I'm bringing a different message than what you're preaching here in your synagogues. Now, another interesting thing of note is from here on out, uh, most of the healings and the casting out of demons after this involves struggle. Up to this point, it's been uh, very often the miracles are instantaneous. You know, the woman, she just touches Jesus' robe and she's healed. He takes the Jairus' daughter by the hand and says, get up, little girl. She gets up. He says to the demons, be gone, and they're gone. But things now progressively become a greater and greater struggle in Jesus' ministry. He takes his message to the streets, literally here now, leaving the synagogues, and he's going to find opposition every step of the way. These are some, some huge changes. As he is moving towards the cross, the journey becomes more and more difficult. So then he sends out his 12 disciples, sending them out two by two. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. And he allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. Uh, a lot of scholars make a big deal out of, you had to have, in, in Jewish law, you had to have two people, uh, two witnesses to make something credible in court. And so sending them out two by two adds credibility. It does, but I, I also look at the human element. Part of this is companionship. They're traveling with somebody. They have someone to encourage them, and they, they can encourage each other. Two people are more likely to uh, continue on in the face of difficulties where one person might give up because they're going to face a lot of difficulties. And so he sends them out two by two. And here's an interesting thing. 
The instructions he gives them are almost the same exact instructions that are given to the people who are about to leave Egypt and leave their slavery. Now think about that. He just left the synagogue to never go back to a synagogue. And he gives his, his people instructions, his disciples, the same instructions that the people about to leave the slavery of Egypt left when they, when they left the instructions they got. I'm not sure of everything that means, but I think it's pretty significant that they're leaving one. This is, this is kind of an, for those of you who know the parables, this is kind of an old wineskin, new wineskin moment. That they need a new wineskin for the new wine. They need a new paradigm, a new way of doing things for the new message. And he sends them out literally with almost nothing. And here's something interesting. The way he sends them out, they're dependent on the hospitality of the places they go to. That if they go somewhere and nobody gives them hospitality, they're not going to hear the message in that town. And they're just going to go on. They're dependent. But here's another thing, and this one is kind of a little, this one takes a little more thought initially. They're not a threat. And that might sound like a strange thing to say, but think of this. In the days that Jesus lived, there is no distinction between religious authority and political authority. They're all one. They worshipped their emperor in Rome. And so religious authority and political authority are one. And think of the history of Christianity. For, for about a thousand years, for about half of Christian history, there was no distinction between political authority and religious authority. In fact, religious authority usually trumped political authority, at least in Western Europe, where it was the bishop or the pope that anointed the king and said, God gives you permission to rule these people. And so, when the Europeans started exploring the rest of the world, one of the most important things they believed they did was they sent missionaries who were employees of the government, who were to kind of quote-unquote Christianize the native people so they'd be Christians just like those people back in Europe, whoever sent them there. And they had, those missionaries had authority very often over life and death, they had the authority to stop any native activities they thought were contrary to the gospel or hindering the message and their missionary work. But when Jesus sends out, and those missionaries had the full power and force of whatever government sent them behind them, including military force. But when Jesus sent out missionaries, he sent them empty-handed, with no authority except casting out demons, healing the sick, and preaching the message that Jesus told them to preach. What a contrast in, in the systems we naturally fall to in humans, which are based on power and authority, as opposed to the system that Jesus had in place, which is opposed to going into a place empty-handed and being dependent. And so he sends them out, and it says, uh, so he sends them out telling the people to repent. He tells them to repent of their sins and turn to God. That message sounds familiar, but it's not the message of Jesus. That's the message of John the Baptist. He tells the people, repent. That's John the Baptist. Get ready. Make straight paths for the Lord. Repent of your sins. Turn from your evil ways and make ready the way of the Lord. And that's the message Jesus sends them out. Now, Jesus has been preaching messages like, blessed are the meek and blessed are the peacemakers. And if someone steals your jacket, give them your shirt. Love your enemies. 
Repentance is in there, but the focus has been something different. But he sends them out. Really what the disciples, they're not preaching the gospel. They're telling people to get ready for the gospel. They're saying, get ready, repent of your sins and get ready because something is coming, something is happening you need to be ready for. And so this message, like I said, it's not the gospel. It's the message to get people ready for the gospel. You know what the very next thing that Mark tells us that happens after this? John the Baptist is beheaded. It's as if his job is done. Almost as if Jesus is giving John the Baptist permission to lay down his burdens, this burden of preparing the people for his coming. Because now, for the short time left, his disciples are going to pick up that message. And they're going to tell the people, get ready, something big is coming. They don't know what it is yet. But they know the preparation for it is repentance. Now here's an interesting thing, and this is kind of where this leaves us, where we started, where Russ read those words of Paul, where he said, when I am strong, or when I am weak, I am strong, that he had this thorn in his flesh so that he would be dependent on Christ. Christ sends out his disciples to be dependent on the people in the towns where they're preaching. And they have this gospel message saying, get ready for something that's coming. And the way you get ready is you repent, literally, to turn around, to turn away from one thing and turn to something else. And where that leaves us as a church is, we got to make sure we're preaching the right message. Because sometimes the church gets caught up in preaching the message of John the Baptist and not the message of Jesus. We got the the preview, but never get to the main show, the feature film. And, and the message of repent isn't the gospel. It's important. It's necessary. But the message, here's how I, Paul summed up the message of the gospel very nicely here. Paul wrote, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. That's the gospel. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. So those who were before Christ lived, the message for them was repent and get ready because Christ is going to die for you. That was the something big that was coming. Now, for those of us who live after Christ's death and resurrection, the message becomes a little different. Not not, not different, the order is different. And I always remember my dad gave me a book years ago that I, unfortunately, I looked for it this week, I couldn't find it, I think I've misplaced it. It was just a little tiny book. And the title of the, I had to read the book because the title intrigued me so much. The title of the book was Forgiveness and Repentance, not Repentance and Forgiveness, but Forgiveness and Repentance, saying for those of us who live on the resurrection side of the cross, we hear the gospel message that Christ died for us, sinners, the ungodly, that he died for us while we were still sinners. So now we need to repent of what, because of what he has done for us. It's hard, like I said, that relationship between God's work in our lives and our faith, it's hard to pin down exactly what it is, exactly kind of the mechanics of it. But living on the resurrection side of the cross, the gospel message is, that Christ died for us, for us sinners while we were still sinners. And so now the good news is that message 
And we have an opportunity now to repent in response for what he's done for us. What he's already, he already did it for us. He didn't say, if you repent, I'll do this. He didn't say, I'll do this, and then you have to repent. He just said, I'm doing this for you. I'm laying down my life for you. And that's it. That's what he says. I'm, that's what I'm doing for you. I lay my life down for you. There's no kind of a, an if clause in there. He just says, I'm doing this for you. Because he is the, the manifestation, you would say, the human form of our God. And this is what our God does. He lays his life down for us. And so now our message of repentance becomes sort of the, I don't want to say addendum, because that makes it an addendum is something you can skip in a book. And repentance is important and necessary. But we can't get mixed up on that the gospel message is Jesus died for us, not that we repent. We repent because he died for us. So let us pray. Lord God, we pray this day that we will always remember that you died for us while we were yet sinners. But we also pray we'll never forget then that this death is a call to us to repent. A call for us to die to our old selves each day. To live the resurrected life that you bring us. And to live that resurrected life among the people here in this town so that they can see just what kind of a God it is that we have. And we pray you'll guide us in this. In Jesus' name, amen.